Hey, what's up? My name is Mike Squires. This is Couchers Podcast, episode number 188. And my guest, Tom Sassano. Have you ever had a friend that you've known for 20 years and you didn't know his last name until he joined your Zoom meeting? Well, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing cousin Tom's last name right. What kind of a friend am I? Uh, what can I say? I met Tom 20 years ago, liked him immediately. Very funny guy. We, he took me around, uh, vintage shopping at some, uh, thrift stores in the Valley way, uh, 2001 where I was down in LA for, you know, some first round of, of loaded, uh, gigs back then. So and I've ran into him over the years. Tom's worked for bands as varied as Weezer, Faster Pussycat, Guns N' Roses, Rolling Stones, Beyonce, and my favorite, Michael Schenker. The man. The man, Michael Schenker. Mr. Big, if you think Michael Schenker is the best, lick my face. That's right. See? That he, Mr. Big is the authority. That's why he's Mr. Big. We had a great time talking. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Stick around because Tom has a great story uh, uh, that has to do with finding not one, uh, not two, but, you know, possibly three, uh, re the remains of three humans. So there you go. You're going to have to stick around for that one. It was a good story. I loved it. Um, Let's see if, uh, hey, check it out. If you want one of these, all you got to do is go to varietycoffeeroasters.com. Add two of these to your shopping cart. These are uh, boxes of coffee. Add uh, this to your shopping cart. It's in the little swag drop down. And at checkout, uh, Use the code COUTRIFS, one word. You get your coffee mug for free. Boom! Or you could just buy a coffee mug for 10 bucks. Thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters. I drink Variety Coffee Roasters uh, every morning. That's right. I start my day with Variety Coffee every single day. Um, and I think you should, too. And I think you should get a coffee mug uh, that says uh, COUTRIFS. And on the other side, it's dirty. It says that's because I use it. Uh, variety on the other side. Boom. Let's see. Thank you. Variety. Oh, check out their subscription service. It's uh, very, very cool. They'll ask you a series of questions, how you prepare your coffee, how you like to drink it, how often do you want it? And then boom, it just shows up in the mail weekly, bi-weekly or monthly. That's sweet. Variety Coffee Roasters. Also, thank you so much to River City Guitars and Marvin Guitars, who co-designed this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh my God, how much do we fucking love this guitar? Jesus Christ, we love it. It's the best. Um, you, can, uh, you can check out that guitar in person at River City Guitars and also at the guitar shop, New York City in Brooklyn. That's right. Two places where you can purchase it. The only two places you can purchase it at the moment. Um, if you're looking to sell or trade something, get a hold of River City Guitars, sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. Tell them I sent you. I wouldn't send you anywhere that I wouldn't go myself. I love those guys. I've known them for a long time. They're good people. And that's it. Hey, listen, don't forget the golden rule, okay? Imagine what a wonderful place the world would be. If you just, if, if we all treated each other the way we wanted to be treated, and I don't mean like uh, dominatrix kind of type shit either. I just mean like socially uh, out in the world, treat people the way you want to be treated. Don't be an asshole. Hey, buddy. Yeah. How you been? <laughs> you know, it's been a COVID kind of year. What's that? A COVID kind of year? It's kind of year where I've been home for 18 months. Yeah, I'm just pretending like it's not real and I'm doing all the things that you're supposed to do, but I'm just, I've basically I've ignored the idea that COVID is crippling and I've doubled down on anything that I can possibly do for I, better or worse. My wife and I have doubled down on cats. <laughs> we now have 
have five cats. Five cats. Yeah, it's 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 we are so far beyond crazy cat people. It's not even fucking funny. I heard a really sad thing the other day, and that was that in 2020, a lot of people got excited because they were home and they were like, oh, I can finally get a dog. And they, you know, tons of people adopted dogs. And then uh, this year, they've all they've surrendered them back to shelters and the shelters are overwhelmed now. And I'm just thinking to myself, you fucking people. Yes. What are you, you thinking? Right. Like, what are you thinking? You know? It's a very self-centered, it's a very self-centered population we live in. Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that people are selfish? I am. I am. <laughs> I, I have, I, I work in a bar yeah. <laughs> because, because that's what I do when I don't have anywhere to go. Right. And I, the other night was a great example. If the people had started eating each other, like we were in an episode of The Walking Dead, I would not have been surprised. People suck so fucking bad. And as my wife always points out, this pandemic has done nothing to make any of us better people. No, it's put us all under magnifying glasses. Yeah, yeah. You, we used to think it was weird when we had our faces covered, you know, because nobody could see a smile. Nobody knew what your intentions were when you said something because right. you read so much in a face. Now we can see people's faces and... I don't personally like anything I see. I'm I'm ready to cash in. I'm just <laughs> ready to get out of here. <laughs> and that's a bummer because I'm generally a cheerful guy. You're in you're in Detroit. I am in the 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 cheapest borough in New York. Yes, Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> I want so I want I want to create a little bit of um, uh, perspective here. Okay. Oh, full admission. In my phone, you have been Cousin Tom for as long as... I only learned your last name when you joined the Zoom meeting. <laughs> Just uh, Cousin Tom. Well, I invited Cousin Mike and Cousin Duff to listen to this next week. Last <laughs> night, I sent them to the uh, they, they were in town last week, and uh, I didn't get to see them. Neither of them. Oh, did you go to the show? I did go to the show, and I yeah. was like, complete fucking fan i i'll be totally honest with you i cried for over two hours i'd never seen them i've worked for every single one of them i'd never seen them all play together is that right ever ever so i'm pretty much sitting there sobbing and my wife is looking kind of embarrassed but you know so that was that was me in the pit at guns and roses in detroit oh that's crazy it was killer they were so good yeah they were so so good I saw them a number of times the first go. Yeah. You know? Um, and, the, man, the show is long. They play for a long time. My wife and I, we went to Mexico City and saw them because uh, yeah. it was a great excuse to go to Mexico City, and we were looking for a vacation, and it just worked out. The bootleg swag in Mexico City. The bootleg oh. DNR swag, it's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we, you know, we met you and I twenty years ago. Did we really? Was yeah, it man. In Detroit that we met. No, no, no. I was. Uh, it must have been the first go around that loaded was was working. Uh, me and Jeff Rouse. I don't know. Maybe I was staying at McBob's house for we were doing something, playing a show or something. Okay. And maybe you, maybe you were staying there. So like we went thrift store shopping together. You like ran me around to some, some great spots. I'm a very nice guy. A hell of a nice guy. <laughs> and uh, a couple years later, I was out on the road and we ran, and we ran into each other in Detroit. In Detroit. I was going to say, we ran into you at the IROC. Is that what that club, I've never yeah. been able to remember the name of that club. Is that yeah. club still yeah. in existence? <laughs> It's the IROC. It's it's one of my wife's it's one of my wife's favorite places. We drive by it constantly trying to figure out a way to get it to open. It's not operating? No, as of right now it's not, but it it, it has not been shut. It just isn't open. You know what I mean? Sure. So nobody really knows what's happening. It's just What a open. crazy spot. They, do they still have all the VCR TVs everywhere and stuff? Honey, still all the TVs on the on the wall at the IROC? 
this is Mike and I. Mike and I ran into each other at the I Rock in two thousand three. Uh, last it was actually open because I was there for like a we opened the doors kind of thing. It it's you know. The place hasn't changed since apparently apparently it's the same <laughs> right amazing they should never change it she's not going to show her face she's making us pancakes oh sweet <laughs> uh so the one thing about that night that i remember distinctly is that i back then i was still eating taco bell i was like man i'm hungry we you know, we got here, we didn't stop and have any food. I walked out and walked down the road and went to Taco Bell, got some food, ate it there, and then walked back. Yes. And the I got back and the and the door guy was like, Where have you been? I was like, Ah, oh, I just walked down to the Taco Bell and had some food. He's like, What the fuck are you thinking, man? You can't walk around here. Is it is it still gnarly like that i mean i never i didn't feel threatened in the least bit you know it's funny it really it, it really depends on who you are right some people would be shit scared to walk around at night here some people make victims out of themselves if you know how to carry yourself you can go pretty much anywhere there are a few places in this in the greater detroit area that I have been advised not to go to just because, but I have no reason to go there in the first place. If I'm going to a place like that at 3 a.m., or you're up to no I'm good looking for trouble, right? You know I mean? And you kind of get what you deserve. The area around the I around the I Rock, we actually live relatively close to it. We live on the east side. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's it's not bad. I mean, yeah. I I went into you know Harpo's. The very famous Detroit nightclub Harpo's is right up the road. And I was there with Michael Shanker three or four years ago and happened to walk into a Coney Island uh, with my kilt on. And it was pretty much like that scene in the in, in, in Animal House when the music stops and everybody looks because there's this white guy with a black bowler and a black canvas <laughs> kilt on. And the guy felt relatively uncomfortable. Yeah. Say Michael Shanker's son Taro was with me, and, and he's like, "What do you think, Mike? Should we go?" It's like probably a good idea. <laughs> well, you probably looked like an alien to them. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I you know I probably looked like a tasty bitch is what I looked like. So you know, we, we made our we made our, our grand exit. Uh, 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 we back to Harpo's. Oh wow. Uh, how did you end up landing in Detroit? Man, that's a that's a whole story. Uh, I I was going through a divorce. Uh huh. And uh, I was living in New Orleans. Okay. And I decided that I was going to move to Chicago, and instead I went to L.A., which you know because it's right on the way from New Orleans to Chicago. Of course, you detour to L.A. for ten months. Yeah, of course. Um, but while I was there, I went to work for the Axel Band and started actually making some money. Um, bought a Harley, hated LA the second time. Don't know why, I really don't know why I went back. And uh, got on my bike and rode to Chicago. Lived in Chicago for about 12 months, but I was all by myself. And I had a really good friend who I met here and uh, I've known her for, well, since I was on tour. And I met her on tour in 2002. We always stayed friends. And uh, so I came to Detroit with really no intention of anything other than just chasing some sort of a weird dream and ended up falling in love with my friend and getting married and staying. Here I am. That's incredible. I love that. Yeah. No, I... I I we were friends for 14 years and ended up she's my wife. That's a uh I think that's a great way that's a great route to do it. Well, I'll tell you what, it sure blew everybody's minds, including hers and mine. <laughs> you know, here we are. But again, here we are. That's that's what it's all about. Right. 
And it's funny, you know, she's a, an extremely independent woman and I'm a man who's on tour seven, eight, nine months out of the year. And you know, we thought that this COVID was going to be the death of us. And it's actually made us a lot, a lot stronger. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, no, we lucked out. We actually enjoy each other's company. Um, <laughs> that we, helps. We work together at the same shithole bar and we hang out with all the same people. And we go Do you guys work the same shifts? Uh, a couple of them. I work, I work some shifts that she doesn't because she has another job elsewhere. Right. We, we share shifts on the weekends. That is a lot of time together. Yeah. yeah. He hasn't killed me yet. That's been a really tricky. <laughs> well, there's still time. I know. That's a that. It's been a tricky year and a half, almost two years for people who have been otherwise accustomed to having more space. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine the people who don't have someone and are just like, you know, stuck at home in their apartment? Uh, basically alone i just like it's been well, a terrible time for folks yeah it has it's 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 certainly it's made introverts out of a lot of people i mean we will see people at the bar that we've known and then they're all of a sudden they're out of our lives and they will stick their little heads out every once in a while and be like and it's right back to their hidey holes um we've noticed something really interesting in the bar business as well is that the pandemic has taught people that there's more to do than sit in a bar. This summer sure. ha has been a real, real roller coaster for at least our piece of the bar business, the bar that we have the most contact with. People aren't going out and drinking on the weekends like they did. If it's if it's a not flooding here, which it has been doing all summer, which has not helped the city at all. Right. Uh, people don't come into the bar. The bars are quiet. Last year, you know, last year during the pandemic, we have a giant patio at our bar, and it's arguably one of the nicest patios in Detroit. Beautiful. It's and it's you don't realize that it's even there. You walk in the back, and it's like this Garden of Eden. And uh, last year, we were just slammed because we were the only bar that could be open because it was all outside. Right. You know, this year, very strange. People just don't drink like they did. Which is a bummer for us alcoholics. Have you flown yet? Last time I flew was home from the Rolling Stones, September 1st, 2019. So that's a good segue. I mean, we're, we're down on the downer stuff right now. But, no, um, stop it, you're making me tear up. Let's, re let's, re let's rewind, 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 rewind. Talk about my wife some more. She makes me smile. Uh, smiles are good. I like you got a real pretty smile. Thank you. Uh, huh? <laughs> you got a pretty boy, you got a pretty mouth. Uh, where'd you grow up? Sonoma County, California. You did Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa. Yeah. Um, that Santa Rosa is just no over the Bay Bridge, it's, it's 59 miles north of San Francisco. Yeah, it's where, the, it's where the wine country and the redwoods meet. Right. Yeah. 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 I've been there. There's so the, a, it's the prettiest place on earth, basically. It really is beautiful. I mean, it, it really was is. until it all burnt every year for the last ten. No, we're, the world's in a in a gnarly spot right now. I think that probably they they, you know, whoever they yeah. are. They probably know more than they're letting on. Yeah, like they're they're saying, ah, it's possible that we are nearly to a, an irreversible tipping point. I think we were probably there 10, 20 years ago. Uh, but they, they don't want us to panic and they don't want havoc. No, of course not. We, uh, I, I, think, I think it's Gaia theory. Gaia, if you're familiar with Gaia theory. No. Uh, Gaia theory, I mean the lunchbox version is basically that our planet is an is an organism is an entity and oh, sure. we have an infection and it will create an antibody that will get rid of us. Oh, I believe that. You know, and that's pretty much how Gaia theory has been playing out. It's making perfect sense. The planet is pretty fucking sick of us. Well, if you have a bug, what does your body do? You you get you get uh, the chills. Yeah. You get the sweats. 
you know, you get a bunch of extreme temperature changes in your body to try and kill off a bug. Yeah. You get the juice okay. penicillin and you get better. More there you go. Please. Uh, I think that's that's what's going to happen to us. You know? Well, thank God you decided to take us on an upswing. Woo! Well, okay, so so you you grow up in Northern California. Yeah. Do you, uh, Here's something I don't know. Do you play music? Only on the stereo. I'm a singer. Yeah. yeah. I'm a singer, so I barely can play the stereo. You know? Yeah, the little I, triangle is the go. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I thought that would turn on my hazard lights. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's funny. I always used to tell people when I, you know, because I was a guitar tech for 14 years before I started doing video. And I could tell people I could build guitars. I can't play them. If I could play them, I wouldn't need the band. <laughs> you know? But yeah, I never, I, I, I don't have the patience that's the problem i really would love to play but i don't have the patience to play growing up was there a lot of music in your house books books Look, i had the beatles for 12 when i was 12 years old for a period of about seven months i collected every single piece of kiss memorabilia there was and as quickly as i was a kiss fan i went back to the beatles and i was a kid who listened to only the the Beatles until probably I was 18 years old when I discovered punk rock. Right. And, you know, that's when my musical borders sort of opened up. Uh, it is, it is a proven fact that the first time I actually heard the song crazy train, I was 34 years old. And Are you went, kidding me? And went, wow, this guy's good. He's going to go somewhere. My first wife is smacking her head. Like you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Four years later, I actually worked Ozfest. Right. You got to meet Ozzy. And I was like, you know, you're good. You should keep at this. <laughs> you might be able to make something of this singing you know, thing. You know, you might be able to quit that day job of yours. Uh, yeah, so I've when you discovered, heard. when you discovered punk rock, what was it that you were into? Were you into the the san francisco stuff like alternative tentacles yeah crucifix you know uh De dead kennedy's that kind yeah. of stuff yeah bang flipper you know i also we had a really cool record store so i was buying minor threat and and the stuff that you could actually get on vinyl who's to do and all that weird shit that was coming from elsewhere but yeah we'd go down to the we'd go down to north beach in san francisco and just hang out at the mabuhe or the on broadway Right. And, uh, try and pick up girls who had nothing better to do. <laughs> uh, was there any crossover for you? Like, were you into any of the thrash metal stuff that was have Exodus and Metallica? No. No. I thought that was bullshit music for bullshit people. Right. <laughs> I was listening to, you know, the the Sex Pistols and like the psychedelic furs and and like English stuff. I really got into the English new wave stuff, but it was never really a fashion thing for me again it was always sort of background because i just read books right so was read books do you still have a big book collection no 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 because I'm, I'm not a, i'm not a real collector i mean i, I would buy paperbacks i'd get the cheapest books i could because i never had any money yeah you know and i would and i'd carry books around in my pocket and i'd carry a paperback book in my pocket any chance that i had that i wasn't moving i would be reading stephen king or tom clancy or you know right. um, i i'm still not a huge music fan i like music you know obviously i hear new stuff every day jesus christ there's a band called cinderella you should check them out they're new <laughs> um, you know i i'm constantly amazed at what i actually missed by not being a music fan and I'm right. learning it all in starting in my mid to late thirties, discovering all this music that was going on around me all the time. When did you start going on the road doing tech work? After my, <laughs> I was a, uh, I was a restaurant manager and bar manager and scenic artist in LA. And my first marriage was coming to a spectacular end. And, uh, I met a fat bastard named Chad Stewart, who was the drummer for Faster Pussycat. 
and uh, we were talking and, and I had just been given the opportunity to drive truck for the band Weezer and followed them around the country on the Green Album uh, tour and said, hey, maybe this is something I should do. And Chad introduced me to Tammy. And the next thing I knew, I was I, I went from the truck driver, the guy in the rider truck, to the tour manager of the last band on a four band bill doing sheds for a summer in 2002. And I've never looked back. That's when we ran into each other. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think I just, if, if I was living at Michael's, I'd just done Weezer. So, uh -huh. and then, yeah, and then, you know, we did that first, the, the tour that made me decide this is what I was going to do was that tour with, I was working for Faster and it was Poison, Cinderella, Winger, and us. And we, we personally, because we weren't making any money as the first band on the four band bill, we did 111 shows in 119 days. Wow. Yeah, we would play and then get on the bus. We play at six, get off at six thirty, load our bus, and go two hundred miles away from the tour, and then play a night gig. It was, I mean, it was, it was, it was madness. I lost thirty nine pounds and picked up a lot of bad habits. Uh, Pretty easy to do on the road. Yeah, yeah. Good time. <laughs> um. I think a lot of people don't realize how hard, even on a big bill like that, you know, that the, with the shows sheds or yeah. yeah. So big sheds for pedestrian listeners, that's like an amphitheater. Yeah. Um, you think, oh, this band sold a lot of records back in the day. They're on this big stage playing a show. These guys are going home to their big houses and their well-groomed dogs. Yeah. Coke and hookers all day, just all day, <laughs> or or absolutely not, you know. Right, but uh, but it's a struggle to to make that business work. Yeah, it's it's it's. I'm I'm actually grateful um, that that's how I came up. I came up from doing clubs because I worked with a lot of guys who you know. Now I work for a vendor, and I work for whoever they put me on rolling stones beyonce whoever and they're great gigs. don't don't get me wrong i'm they're wonderful gigs but you will hear people motherfucking this hotel or that flight or yeah you know i'm like man you should try 17 days without a bath right you no know? and you're on the you're on a 25 year old bus with no ac and you're going through texas in july and oh, that's a tough so high, you haven't you haven't slept in six days and you're just miserable that's touring i mean that's you really you really get the meat of a tour when you're in a van or when you're on a bus that you can barely afford um so i'm always very thankful i'm very thankful for production coordinators and i'm thankful for a nice room i'm thankful for my paycheck being on time you know you'll never hear a complaint out of me nothing says thank you like money Nothing says thank you like money on time. Yeah. You have to beg for it or beat somebody <laughs> up. You know, because that's something that a time or two. Uh, what did you do on the Stones tour? I, I am now I am now a video guy. So I build LED, which is the great big TVs. Yeah. Besides the stage, and then I'm a cameraman. So I was I was Keith Keith's cameraman for the last tour they did. Wait a minute. Yes. How? So, all right, I want you to walk me through the evolution of, yeah, sure, I'll drive the truck for Weezer, to, okay, I'll tour manage Faster Pussycat, to, I know you work with Michael Shanker, mm -hmm. which is incredible, one of the all-time greats. I had the opportunity to see you guys in Seattle years ago, still mind-bogglingly good. This fucking guy is a inhuman. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> in more ways than one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how do you go from being a tour manager to uh, yeah, I can hold a camera and make sure to get good angles and how does that opportunity present itself and how do you find yourself saying yes? 
I'm going to regret saying this, but I owe it all to fucking Tom Mayhew. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was I don't want to owe Tom anything. I know. Tell me about it. Yeah. If you're listening, Tom, fuck you very much for this I, wonderful life. I love Tom. Yeah. What a fucking knucklehead. I love so many things. Yeah. Uh, no, he's 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 one of the all time greats. Um, I was working for a band as a guitar tech. And I had already started working for GNR, Axel's GNR. Mm -hmm. So I went from, I was going from a seriously nice paycheck each week to what the hell money. And, you know, living in LA and sucking, just hating life. Um, I'm not going to mention the band, but I, the lead singer, the guy who created the band, it's an absolute piece of shit. He's he's certifiably insane, and loves nothing better than not taking his pills. Well, that's um, a, there's a lot of bands that could be. Yeah, well, like I said, um, and I I lost the ability to let him believe that I gave a fuck because I really stopped giving a fuck. We're we're one we're a one bus one trailer tour, and he's insane in the front lounge and we're all hiding in our bunks because he's just flying off the walls and doing it just for the sheer joy of seeing us all be miserable and i i got to the point where i just couldn't i just couldn't i tell him to go fuck himself to his face i just i couldn't stand the man right and they we were on tour and uh he fired me and i was devastated I've never been fired. I've never been let go off tour. Uh, I got home and I just bought the Harley. And the day, the day after the, the band was playing at the Wiltern and they did the show, I went home, grabbed my shit off the bus and went home and got on my bike and went down to San Diego to a bike swap meet. Oh, and I'll, I'll never forget it. I was, I was going down the freeway and it's the summer. I'm in Southern California on this big, beautiful Harley. And this entire, just the weight of the world had just come off my shoulders. And I was so fucking happy. I said, I'm never going back, never going back to working for the artist. I can't, I just can't do it. Right now. Here I am. You know, I had done some set carp work and as a set carp, for GNR, Axel's GNR, there was always an opportunity to do camera because they would much rather pay people who they're already bringing on tour to shoot the shows and you get a more reliable product if it's the same guy every night rather than just picking some knucklehead out of the crowd. So I started shooting by being Axel's guy on his band and called Tom May, who said, hey, is there any chance that I can figure out a way to get some more camera work? And he introduced me to John Weissman, who owned Chaos Video. And they taught me how to be a cameraman. And here I am. Just like that. Just like that. Sheer, sheer force of will and determination. I was not going to get a job because I suck at job. Jobs are weird, especially if you've lived the pirate's life. Well, and that, you know, and that's the thing, I, you know, not only that, but I live my best life. I get to travel all over the world and somebody else pays for it. So, right. you know, how much opportunity, I mean, to give listeners a perspective on traveling around the world under these circumstances, how much opportunity do you have to see the town you're in? Because your day is much different than the artist's day it it would de it would depend on the tour is pretty much how i would oh, i mean how i always answer that question you know on a show like gnr or the stones you're coming in you've got you've had a nice flight in you're not doing anything other than arrive in the city you may have a day off to get yourself together then you, you'll have your build day then you'll have your show day and then you'll fly to the next city so you have plenty of opportunity if you have the where you know if you have the desire yeah. to go out and check out your surroundings. Uh, if you're on a club tour or or a theater tour and you need to be making the money, 
you see a lot of backstages. You yeah. Know, you see a lot of food being brought in, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I always make it a point to try and get out in every city I'm in, no matter what, just because who knows when I'm when I'll be there again. Do you ever stay like if a tour is wrapping up in an interesting place? Do you ever stick around for some extra time? <laughs> my my wife said, my dream is to retire to Barcelona. Oh. And I said, well, fuck, that's a pretty good dream. I'll take, I'll, I'll hop on that with you. I said, have you ever been? She goes, no. <laughs> well, maybe we should go to Barcelona and check yeah. it out. It just so happens that I end up booking on Beyonce, which was two U.S. and one European tours. And the last show of the European leg was in Barcelona. So I'm there and I've got a flight home. So she flies out. We finish loading the trucks and she's at my hotel. Oh, great. In my room when I get there and we spend seven days in Barcelona and she got very adept at laying on the beach, eating salsich and drinking mojitos because there's there's little cabana men that walk around the public beaches yeah. with a raisin mojito. And she, yo, mojito boy. Uh, so we we did that. We went to uh, Montserrat. We went all over the place. So it went to museums and restaurants and oh, bars. I love Barcelona. I love Spain. Oh, the the, the Ramblas is just the most amazing place on the planet. Um, funny thing was, I'm known for saying I've got a really horrible idea. And the last day, me we, too. <laughs> yeah, the last day that we were there, I said, I said, you know, I'm making money because I'm on this Beyonce yeah. tour thing for money. Let's tear up our tickets and let's go, let's go crash her brother's house. Her brother lives in Rome, so we tore basically tore up our tickets, and we flew to Rome for three days, and went to the Vatican and the Trevi Fountain. I've never around. been to Rome. Him and his drunken friends showed us the best time. And although it was expensive, it was the best money we ever spent. We had the greatest time. We flew back to Barcelona because the cheapest of the expensive alternatives was to still fly out of the city that we had our tickets on. Right. So we flew to Rome, flew back, stayed with a buddy of mine, Michael Schenker Santaro, who lives in Barcelona. We stayed in his apartment with all of our luggage and all my tour crap and uh went to the airport and flew home the next day so i mean i guess i guess that counts travel money spending travel money is never money you'll regret spending i couldn't agree more I because agree. i don't know i mean stuff is cool but really experiences are where it's at right we we went to after stones we had not taken a vacation since that Barcelona vacation. So after the stones in 19, uh, we flew to Seattle and we had a wedding to go to in San Francisco. And we spent 10 days driving from Seattle to San Francisco. To go on the one Oh one. We did everything. We yeah. I used to live in Ashland, Oregon. So we, we stayed four days to Seattle. We stayed two days in Portland. We went to Ashland. We went, over to the coast from from medford and got on redwood highway and we drove through the giant sequoia which you could drive your car through yeah we stayed in eureka and fort bragg and we got to the wedding and then we had a couple of days in san francisco and we were <laughs> eating cupcakes in golden gate park and i looked at my wife and went i have a really horrible idea <laughs> <laughs> he's like go on <laughs> i said let's tear up our tickets and rent a car drive home she goes that would be a waste of money i said route 66 she's like yeah i'm in so we basically tore up our tickets rented a mercedes and we drove route 66 home spent another six days on the road oh that's great i love a road trip man her and i are the world's greatest road trippers um that's how we pretty much go everywhere right you know, i do enough flying i don't Sure. Plane. obviously seattle because we had the plan to do the, the west coast it made sense to fly to seattle but we're planning our next trips you know one to take us to seattle across the top 
and then back down. She's never been to Denver. And what I really want to do, even though it involves Florida, is I want to <laughs> oh, Florida, I mean, there not there a Spanish country somewhere that wants that piece of shit state? Because I fucking hate it. Uh, but I want to go to Key West. You know, if it's yeah. good enough for Hemingway, it's good enough for me. I've never been. I have been to Cuba. I've been to Cuba twice. Uh, were you there doing music or were you adventure traveling? That sh shitty band that I refused to talk about uh, took me there to entertain the troops at Guantanamo. We were there for eight days. Huh. And then that really cool band called the Rolling Stones took me there in 2016 to do oh. the Giant Havana show. Wait a minute. You were at Guantanamo for eight days? Yeah. That's not a very big space to occupy for eight days that's true but we did a lot of cool stuff and we did it for a lot of really 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 deserving soldiers who do a really really horrible job right well, yeah not meaning you know all the detainees from the middle east are at guantanamo yeah no it's a and a... and it is probably one of the most hazardous duties in all of the armed forces is working those those military prisons it's it, it it was a nightmare seeing some of the kids who we put in that position tremendously ill-equipped to deal with the people they were dealing with i was a marine i, I joined the marine corps, corps as a young kid so i understand like you know most people join 18 19 years old they're they're boys yeah. they're young you know they're young they quickly are indoctrinated into the responsibilities of men, but few are, you know, really equipped to make the kinds of decisions that that men make or that just adults make. Yeah, it was it was it, it was almost heartbreaking to see. I mean, the people wouldn't think that you would have that kind of a duty in this island paradise, weird country that's gorgeous. Yeah, and just have raging PTSD from having to deal with these these bombers and these really really intelligent people. I mean, sure. if, you were, if you weren't a, a target of a, a person of interest or a value, they would they just blow you up. These are people that they're snatching out of the countries and bringing back here, which means that they're probably not dummies. And it was a hell of a duty for some of these kids. Um, to, to be put through and you you just saw it on their faces they were just you know beat up mm. beat up bad let me ask you this that was your first trip yes your second trip obviously very much different you're not um you know basically stuck in a very small walled off portion of the country that the u.s had you know has occupied for half a century right um over half a century you're there with the rolling stones who don't you know they can they can as english citizens they can travel around that country freely as freely as they wish um you you didn't have the same restrictions were you able to see havana I don't think you I don't think you understand exactly how incredible this opportunity was. The Rolling Stones were on tour in South America when the deal got made to do the show. And the deal was you're going to be the first American rock band because you know it got close to us and about the same time that rock and roll got started there's never been a concert a rock concert in Havana um anybody i mean anybody from anywhere in the world hasn't done did rage go there i have no idea oh. i don't know uh <laughs> i'll look at i'll look it up in a book um <laughs> so the the deal is we're a communist country you want to play a show but you can't sell tickets because tickets create Ticket prices. Ticket prices create a hierarchy, and we're a communist country. You can't do that. 
So, and again, I, I mean, I, I think I have it right. I think basically what happened was either Live Nation or whoever, whoever was promoting the show said, well, we'll just sell it as a DVD. We'll go film it. And we don't have to charge any tickets because we'll make our money elsewhere. So they brought everything for a concert. I think there was something like 70 containers flown over and it was staging and generators and toilets and snow vents and I mean everything none of this existed in Cuba so it all had to come over but the Stones are on tour so we got hired to be a satellite crew to come in and build in you know for instance I was on the video crew so we were building LED for the outfield because they were expecting a million people and in fact I think it was just over 800,000 people turned up Wow. Because it was free. Right. So we got there. Oh, sorry. Let me back up. Before before we got there, it got announced that President Obama was going to go down and watch the Florida Marlins play the Cuban national baseball team. And he was going to sign some big trade agreements. We were playing. The show was next door to where the baseball diamond was. And it was the place got put on lockdown. So we were supposed to go down there for eight days. It ended up, we already had all our flights and our visas. So now there's this chunk of six days where we're not even allowed on the site. So okay. we ended up being down there. We flew in, we spent four hours. We built <laughs> the, out, the outfield LED. We went to the, the hotel where Al Capone stayed when he used to go down there in old Havana. Yep. And we had the next 16 days off. 16. We had, to, we had to go in. We had to go in once a day for about 35 minutes to make sure that the LED was covered with plastic. We'd eat catering and then we'd go fuck off in Havana. Did you leave Havana at all? No. No, we didn't. Uh, but we didn't uh, need to. It was so amazing. Um I yeah. What about that? Um, I guess is it the the wall on the north, the north side that faces the water. You, you can walk. Out. Yeah, it's so incredible. I, I've got a bunch of pictures. I could send you a bunch of pictures of that stuff. The cars, all yeah. that stuff is crazy. You know, those cars are all Russian underneath the underneath the hood because it's the parts they could get. The old motorcycles there too are incredible. Yeah, yeah. I think but the a most amazing part about spending time there for me. I was there for a month. Oh, wow. Doing what? Cycling. Really? I cycled that whole fucking island. It was awesome. Did you get over you did you get over to the city? What's the city where they say is the home of salsa? Do you know what that city's called? Is it Santiago? So there's Santiago de Cuba that I went to uh, my one of my favorite places was a really modest that place is beautiful and very colonial uh, architecturally Sim Fuego we met some great people there you know we stayed in people's homes yeah it was incredible but yeah. even in, in you know you you walk through these towns and villages and cities where even in Havana where half of a wall is falling down like i never felt never felt threatened no and that's some and now i wouldn't do that in brazil <laughs> <laughs> for good reason so you know started on brazil so uh but, we made in brazil <laughs> <laughs> You know, I know that the the penalties are very steep for Cuban citizens who are convicted of assaulting tourists because tourism is such a is like the industry for Cuba. It's I, the way it was explained to me. We because we had so much free time, we I, we spent a lot of time in the hotel bar. Go figure. And we met a man by the name of Rene who was the bartender, and. He's like, you don't understand. He goes, in Cuba, when you get in trouble, your whole family goes to prison. You yeah. are, it's not just you. And it, it, it 
creates an atmosphere where people tend to really not fuck up. Because, well, people police each other as well. Yeah, yeah. They and they don't they don't dime each other out. They just make sure that everybody stays on the straight and narrow because the penalties are far more, you know, far reaching than just the individual. It it could lead to their families being detained, and and that's you know not cool. Or more. Or more. Yeah, no, that was an incredible experience. I'm so stoked that you got to spend so much time there. It's a. Did you go? Did you happen to go to the Museum of the Revolution? Oh yeah, we were. The, our hotel was right across the street from. It. Crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, it like the face of it is still riddled with bullets. Yeah, yeah they didn't. They didn't bother. You know, fixing that. Story, isn't it? You know. Yeah. So yeah, no, a wonderful place. And we were supposed to go, my wife got sick, but uh, the Stones tour ended in Miami and she was going to fly to Miami and we were going to hop a flight over. Because what a lot of people don't understand is all that squeaking Donald Trump did about closing Cuba up, all he did was stop the, the cruise ships from going. You can still buy a ticket, fly there. Right. So, you know. It was but trickier don't for me. I... Because we don't want you to fuck it up. I went in 2006 or 2007, so it was a bit of a trickier song and dance for yeah. me. I had to go through Mexico. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did the whole piece of paper in the passport trick? Yep. I actually lost my tourist visa while I was there. I had to spend a day at immigration, and then by the time I was leaving, uh, you know, I had practiced my conversational Spanish enough that at that point when the agents were like, this is not your card. Yeah. I was able to explain to them how I had lost it and had to spend a day at immigration and blah, blah, blah. Nice. Um, but for, a, you know, I guess they could tell I wasn't Cuban just because I spoke Spanish so poorly and English and, bar and, barely and, better. <laughs> and t -shirt, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to ask you, you told me a story when I saw you in Albany, when I um, uh, I came up to see Michael. Michael play at the Egg. What a crazy place that is, right? Hey, welcome to the Egg. What's loading like there? Uh, Clearly they have like, lifts that... Yeah, about like you'd figure. Yeah. Kind of a pain in the ass. It's, it's better than the House of Blues Chicago and worse than everywhere else. So. <laughs> Because, you know, uh, the House of Blues in Chicago, you're six floors down underneath the road. There is a freight elevator, and the, the guy that runs it is a, just a cock smooch. I mean, he's terrible. Right. And getting him to actually operate the elevator so you can get your shit upstairs is kind of a nightmare. But, uh, yeah, that's the egg. Hey, hey, hate to bother you while you're at work, fella. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hate to bother you while you're working. Could you push the button? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, that's yeah. my that's one of my favorite comments to someone who's doing a shitty job or is ignoring you and yeah. you just need them to do their job for you. So, yes. So the story, uh, the reason for this call. Well, no, not entirely, but that that was a that this is a great story you told me. Um, and so let's back it all the way up to to you getting the house and. And, and take me through the process. Sure. Uh, this, just know this. My wife hates the fact that you heard this story. She hates the fact that anybody has heard this story. Really? So, she, so oh, and there is a cat fight happening. Uh, so is she superstitious? Huh? Is she superstitious? No, no, it's not. Well, you know, she's Sicilian. Does that yeah. count? <laughs> uh, okay, so... We close on the house in on Friday the 13th of November 2015. Okay. I'm on tour when the house gets closed on. Uh, I'm out doing Trans-Siberian Orchestra. So everything had to be done by proxy. And her and I aren't married, but we know that we're obviously, we're in it for the long haul. So we're writing all these documents that stay, you know, if I die in a fiery TSO accident, the house is hers and all this stuff. But the house had not been lived in in either seven or eight years, somewhere in there. 
and it had gone through a lot of incarnations. The house is uh, on the east side of Detroit, um, over about a quarter, half mile from Comerica Park and Ford Field. So we're on the very near east side. We're very close to downtown and Easter Market. Uh, the neighborhood was one of the one of the neighborhoods that really got hit by white flight after the riots. Uh, a lot of green space around us. Our block is 26 home lots, I think. There's only six houses standing, seven. Wow. The block behind us is 26 home lots, not a single house standing. We're surrounded by pheasants. And it's like we live in the middle of a nature preserve in the middle of Detroit. That's uh, crazy. Yeah. So I get off to I get off tour on New Year's Eve, fly home to the house I've never seen in person. She looked at it. We took pictures. We haggled it back and forth. I'd never been in it. Didn't know what I was walking into. Uh, and it's January in Detroit, which I don't know if you know this, but it's a little brisk. Yeah. Um, Wear a coat. It was, it was anywhere between zero and 10 degrees, maybe 10 below, depending on the morning. So we could only get in about maybe 90 minutes of work before my computer would freeze from the cold and we just couldn't take it anymore. Um, so it, it took us three months. We demoed all the stuff ourselves. We had piles and piles of crap in the kitchen. And I mean, piles as in five and six foot high that were left in the house. Wow. The house was left just stuffed full of garbage. So we're throwing stuff out the windows. Uh, we rented a bin and we filled a 30 yard container with all the stuff that was in the house and it took us close to three months to clean it due to the temperature and the amount of shit and we didn't have any money right um we basically decided to do it ourselves one of the things that we noticed when we first got in the house was one of the beams had rotted in the kitchen that the house was the house was originally a four-bedroom house about 2200 square feet in the 1930s, an extra, say, 1,900 square feet was added to it in the back. Really? Which, is, which isn't over the basement. It's over a crawl space. So an extra 1,900? Yeah. That's like a, that's bigger than my house. Yeah, no, we, we're sitting, we're living in approximately, I'm guessing about 4,000 square feet. If I had to measure, it's 3,900, 4,000 square feet. Wow. It's six bedrooms. Yeah. Um, and it was seven. But we knocked down a wall and made our, our bedroom big, big boy, big girl bedroom. Right. <laughs> so, anywho, half the house is over the basement, half the house is over a crawl space. The beam that was broken was on the crawl space side. And the only way to access the crawl space, and this is important, is through a hatch in the side of the basement. Flip it up, climb in. There's no exterior access. We also discovered that there was a very complex buzzer system put into this house between the basement and the top floors. And we could never figure out why, because it was a two way system to buzz. And it was just, it was just bells and, and you know, buzzer, buzzer or bell. Still functioning. <laughs> Not functioning, but still installed. And we are approximately four blocks as the crow flies from the Detroit River, which means we're about five and a half blocks as the crow flies from Canada. During Prohibition, a lot of houses here gained a lot of notoriety for being stash houses and thieves' dens and all kinds of crazy shit on the east side because we're next to Canada and that's where the booze would come through. So Joe Kennedy made his millions. So you have the buzzer system, which is making us scratch our heads. Uh, one day in the summer, I was, I was just home from the Stones and I was getting ready to go out on Beyonce. Stones, Cuba, getting ready to go out on Beyonce crawl under the house to figure out 
how big a beam I've got to buy or what kind of a replacement I need to do, you know, what kind of, what do I need to do basically? Cause all we see is this in the kitchen. Right. So I throw on my coveralls and I'm, I hate bugs. So I'm like all suited up rubber bands. I don't want spiders. I don't want earwigs. I don't want nothing. Same. Get under the house with my little flashlight, trying to figure out what I need. And keep laying on a rock and it's digging into my back. It's pissing me off. I keep moving around it, trying to get comfortable under there because I'm trying to draw, make a drawing of what I need. It's hot, stupid. But this fucking rock is just pissing me off. I reach behind me, pull the rock out. And I look at it, and I'm like, huh, it's a crazy looking rock. <laughs> kind of looks like a vertebrae. It's another one. A couple more. Next thing I notice, I'm actually sitting in this giant pile of white. And I mean white, like table salt white and I'm like that's lime you like boogie out of the fucking crawl space sure vertebrae grab the wife like what the hell are we going to do about this I don't know so I went back in and I grabbed a bunch of these bones and we put them in a milk crate and we drove over to the nearest police precinct how many miles away is that? What was that? It was about four miles away. Yeah, now now we're very close. But yeah, they were relocated. So it was about four miles away. Uh, yeah, no police presence when we moved in. Right. No police presence now, which is A-OK. -okay. We, we take all these bones and we show up at the precinct. It's a milk crate. There's probably 12, 15 bones in there. And guy's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, he's like, let me get a detective. He's like, are you here for a confession? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, what, what kind of a story do you want to tell us? Uh, we talk with this desk sergeant, and he says, we're going to send somebody out to the house. Uh, there's obviously something happened. Because I explained lime pit, a bunch of bones, crawl space, no exterior access. So it wasn't an animal. It wasn't a dog that brought another animal underneath there and ate it or left it because there was no ex exterior access. So you could not get in. So nine has to go off and do some stuff. I'm just sitting here waiting for the detective. Nine, nine is my wife. Uh, this, this young man shows up. He's like a young Denzel. He is fucking handsome as fuck, right? Full rig, Adidas. <laughs> full rig Adidas workout suit, like chocolate brown with the matching shoes. This guy is straight up one of the coolest motherfuckers ever. Right. Like, young guy, about 26, 27. Detective, toothpick. He goes, I understand you got some bones. <laughs> <laughs> you want to show me where the bones are? I'm like, sure. We go walking down the stairs. He's like, oh. He's like, I'm not going down there in my sweet suit. The fuck he wasn't. <laughs> you give him the coveralls? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a couple rubber bands, bud. <laughs> so he's, he crawls in down there with the coveralls on over his Adidas tracksuit, but he's still wearing his, his fucking shiny new kicks, right? Oh, no. Just motherfucking the whole process. This sucks. He's down there. I don't know what the hell he's doing. He's down there for uh, over an hour. He, come, he comes out. He's like, well, that's one track suit I can throw away. Right. He said, uh, it, it would appear there's probably three people down there. Oof. And I said, how can you tell? He goes, well, just by the number of parts and things that we found. He said, found no, no heads, so there's no teeth. So there's no dental records and obviously there's no skin because it's all bleached bone. So there's really no telling how long the bones have been down there. 
So there you are. That was I mean, it. And he gets ready. He gets ready to leave. And I said, "What, what are you going to do with the bones?" He goes, well, not "My bones." What do you mean they're not your bones? I got their bones in my crawl space. And he goes, "Yeah, your bones are in your crawl space." Have a nice day. <laughs> he left. So he said, "I sort of put them all in a pile," and uh, I talked to my wife about it. The house has a really, really welcoming, cool energy. Um, we are not in any way, shape, or form updating this house in any way. We're we're buying vintage fixtures and. We're taking great pains to try and keep it as original as possible. And we kind of figure that whoever's down there appreciates what we're doing. So we just, we leave it. There they are. We got housemates. So this is crazy. I've never found a human body before, you know, or remains. Yeah. Um, do you... Was there, did you, when you pulled that first vertebrae out, you, you didn't, re, it didn't really hit you because it's, you don't expect that kind of thing, right? No, like I said, I was like, this is the weirdest looking rock I've ever seen. And it took me a minute to process what I was holding. But when you did, did you have a moment of like, I got to get out of here? Did you have a claustrophobic moment where you're like, I'm. I'll put it to you this way. I don't think this fat ass has ever moved as fast. In <laughs> <life>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you guys, have you guys done anything, you know, are you guys ceremonial type people? Do you, have you done anything to say, Hey, we're not going to move you. Have you? Yeah. Oh yeah. We say hi to them all the time. We say hi to them when we go in the basement. It's their house too. It's kind of how we look at it. It's, you know, it goes back to me saying this house has such a really cool vibe. I think they appreciate the fact, whoever they are. Right. Again, we have no idea who, who they knows? are. They may have been viciously murdered down there and have absolutely no business being there. But the fact of the matter is, there has to be some sort of energy attached to them. And sure. we are not here to fucking disturb them, other than I wanted to hang a bunch of Christmas lights and put up a big plexiglass window so I could show everybody. But my wife said, you're not. So. Are there any other like clues in the architecture or the addition of the house? Is there anything? Was there a hatch over where the, the bodies were? Like someone dragged them down there. And through the hole in the side of the basement. And they had dug a lime pit. They dug a pit, they filled it with lime and put a bunch of bodies in it. And then built the addition over that because in a oh, crawl no, space I mean, it was I think it was post addition. I think it was it was the the addition was put on as best we can guess, the addition was put on in like nineteen thirty eight. Because you'll see some hand we found some handwriting. Some kid was practicing his signature. Ray, what's his name? Ray Palmisano? I think it is. He practicing his scrawl. It's up in the attic and we found it other places. Right. Um, so that's how long the addition has been here. So the addition's been here 80 years. And there's no other clues in... But like I said... I mean, I wonder the if buzzers, there were... The buzzers. If the buzzers made this a fucking stash house for illegal liquor, then, you know... Who knows? You hang out with dogs. You know, a lot right? of nefarious shit. Yeah, yeah. Who know? I mean, who knows? Like, like I said, it could have been you know mahjong and contract killers. We have no idea. We do know that there was a system set up to tell people when to shut the fuck up down in the basement, right? And you know, all clear, so case, all right, kind of buzzer system. That's in place. It's still in place now. It doesn't work because we've gutted most of the wiring, so the house doesn't burn down. But those buzzers are still in place, and we have sort of done a, a very layman's type of search on the house and the property, but we haven't really found anything of interest. Um, like she was like, God, let it be Hoffa. Let it be Hoffa. The federal government. Will pay <laughs> the you know, Hoffa's in New York. We're not going to find it here. Have you gone through and looked at like the family records of the people who've owned the house previously and tried yeah. to put any pieces together that way? 
not with any real not with any real intent you know yeah. we we've, we've talked about doing it but we talk about doing a lot of things i sure. learned how to do yoga so yeah. <laughs> uh, i swore i was gonna learn sign language during the pandemic and i got through about two weeks of that and just realized i was just bored right um can't play guitar still so you know we just chalk up family history of the house to you know like i said yoga and playing guitar what a crazy crazy story yeah. it's one of it's one of our stories it's it's this is a crazy life i have a crazy wife and i live a crazy life and it's just par for the course right you know let me ask you this yes huh? what i was reading your guitar is this a crosby oh yeah that's uh it's like a robin crosby tribute guitar i see yeah uh, built by my friend John Sullivan at Sully Guitars. Very nice. Um, will you go out with the Stones when they are out sans Charlie? I don't know. Is Charlie not going to be a part of it anymore? That's. I just saw the headline that he's not going to go out on this tour. I don't know if it's COVID related. You know, I just. It's I read probably the he's eighty-one related. I mean, What's that? Eighty-one years old. Yeah. Uh, the company that I, I work for a company called Solotech USA, which was, uh, the American offshoot of the parent company, which is from Montreal. And that's who I did the stones with. And that company no longer exists. Oh, so shit. I don't know who's doing the stones. I don't know who, what vendor has it for video. I have actually called my project manager who, who is now forming a new company. Uh, and I asked him last night, I sent him a text. I said, Hey, are you guys doing the stones? Cause I wanted to throw my name in the hat if it's available, but I don't know who's doing it. Uh, did that fall apart because of the vacuum that COVID created for touring? No, no, mm-hmm. no that, that fell apart because the, the lighting and video industry is, I've never really seen a business like it. It's the same 12 guys have owned all the video companies throughout history. And they keep buying each other and changing the names and new power structures and new cities. And, but it's always, always the same guys. Sounds like record yeah. labels. <laughs> yeah, there's they're, they're PRG, there's Solotech, there's, you know, like four companies. But they have been responsible for 50 different entities throughout the last 30 years, which is basically the life of video. You know, because video spawned from the lighting lighting business. Um, a right, lot of right. the original video guys are all lighting guys. So, you know, all the kids now are coming in that are video specific. But So that your intention is that... A, then there's me, a guitar tech who has no business doing either. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I had one guy, I had one guy say to me, fuck, are we really hiring background guys now? <laughs> like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I figure a lot dumber people than me do a really good job at it. So I can figure it out. That's the way I see most things. Yeah. yeah. So that's your intention is once touring is back full swing. That's where you'll go. What about if, if Michael goes back out? That is one that I have been asking myself for the last two and a half years. Uh, Michael's son, who is a very, very dear friend of mine, uh, has always been his guy. When I first started working, I mean, the way I came into working for that band is a whole nother episode of this show. Um, The long and the short of it is, when I went to work for that band, his son was 26, and he was the t-shirt guy. But from the very first day, I realized that he was the only person on the planet that Michael trusted. Michael, Michael is very, very hard. It's very hard to gain his trust. He's been mishandled and he's made a lot of really bad mistakes. Sure. His career, which have cost him dearly. He was fortunate enough to catch himself before it was too late, before he became a headline and turned his life around and for the better of everybody. I mean, he's a, he's a genius when it comes to playing guitar. 
he made he made a fan of guitar. He made me a fan of guitar, and I never was. I saw him play rock bottom the first night that I worked for him in Phoenix, the very first day I was on tour with him, and I fell in love with him. I was like, that was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. You know, he plays guitar like nobody else I know. For one thing, he plays it all one handed. He doesn't even strum the guitars. He plays it all with his right. You know, and the you know what a humunculus is? Who? A humunculus? No. A humunculus is a picture that can be taken of the brain that shows electrical stimulus. And like let's say you're a piano player or a guitar player, you'll have huge hands because all of your that's where your that's where your brain power goes. Like if you're a writer, your head will be big. And it's actually a picture that you can see when the brain gets stimulated by somebody doing something like that. Like a runner will have big legs. Right. You know? And it's this photo. I've always wanted to see what Michael's humunculus would look like because he probably would have hands bigger than himself because of the amount of power and the amount of skill that he has doing what he does. I know that's a very esoteric word. No, he, he keeps a very simple pedal board and rig too. And which um, I was just, he's such an, an old school guy. You look at his pedal board. He's got, there's three things on there. After, and, after, after we're done, after, after we're done with this, I want to continue the phone call with you. Cause I want to tell you a story that I will not tell here. I would love to hear about, it. about exactly that. It's one of the funniest fucking things I've ever seen in my life. And it happened on that metal show. I, c I couldn't believe how simple his i mean it's just like he had i think two marshals did he have two marshals three three marshals yeah. a pedal board with a wah and two delays yeah two carbon copies and a and a fucking and a volume pedal and a wah and that's it see ya and uh magic it's all uh yeah he's just a magic person. you'll hear me say this again when i tell you the story but as michael puts it <laughs> Sometimes it is not in the equipment. <laughs> uh, one thing that you did tell me, because I was like, God, it just sounded incredible. And you told me that he spends some time, like a pretty good amount of time during sound check, finding where on stage uh, certain frequencies will feed back and they get taped off. Michael, That's... Michael runs his own monitors. Huh. Michael has these, this series of 12 inch carbons, uh, and volume pedals that he will place when we walk into a venue, when we walk into a venue, he'll get up on stage and he will start playing and all of his, all of his monitors, these little bitty monitors with their little bitty volume pedals, he will move them and kick them. So that he can, when he's standing at his rig, at his microphone, which he never uses, it didn't used to even have a cable attached to it. Right. <laughs> so he knew where to walk to in the dark. Right. Now he speaks, but he didn't used to. Uh, and he will, he'll be playing and then he'll walk to one of his, what he calls the sweet spots on stage. And he'll turn on that volume pedal and there's his little speaker. Wow. And then he'll turn it off and he'll walk over to another sweet spot that he found over here and turn on that volume pedal. So he is, he's running his own monitor rig while he's playing. Right. It's it, the man is fascinating. You know, he doesn't ride with us on the bus. He drives himself anything under 500 miles. He's behind us in a car with the radio off. <laughs> What's his preferred rental car? Mercedes. I would imagine it'd be a Mercedes or a Java, Java, you know. Well, you know, the German yeah. engineering is superior. You yeah, Ford, yeah. Dodge. Yeah, engineers. <laughs> uh, yeah, he uh, he drives himself anything under 500 miles, and he does not play the radio. Who was that maniac bass player that was on that, that tour that I saw you in Seattle? It's a bald guy. Rev. Shredding bass player and Rev. very active on stage. Rev Jones is his name. He's from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he plays, I don't know if he still does, because I don't even know if Leslie's alive, 
but he played in Mountain. Wow. In the West. And what's really funny is, you know McCready, right? Yeah, of course. We played Seattle and he got in contact with me and said, hey, could I come to the show? I'm like, sure, of course. I mean, I didn't know him from Adam. I give a fuck about that Seattle sound. Uh, but my, but my, one of my guitar tacks was a huge Pearl Jam guy. And he's, he's just gooey. Oh my God. Oh my God. McCready's over there asking him questions. And he's looking at the rig and he's like, that's not a fucking rig. That's a tuner. What the hell? Because well, McCready's got a UFO cover band. I'm aware of this. And that's yeah. why we got him passes to come see the show. I'm like, okay, you're obviously, you're a, you're a rock star Uber fan. Super fan, yeah. Yeah, which is fine. That's totally cool. I mean, we all have our idols. I met one of my idols yesterday, and you will not believe who it is. Anyway. Louis Gossett Jr. No, it's not. It's Hel it's Hank Winchester from WDIV News. He does the help the helping <laughs> Hank segment. And he's the guy that you call when people are dumping garbage on your street, and he goes and gets people riled up. Right. He came into the bar yesterday, and I got to meet him. So that was Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, so anyway... Uh, so yeah, so so Rev, he's watching this whole thing and he's like, he's like, you'll not believe this, but I've seen Michael get that way. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, Michael's got his idols. And I go, who in the fuck is Michael's idol? And he goes, Leslie West. Michael turns into a 15 year old girl when he gets her out, Leslie West. Wow. He just lo he loses his mind. Well, that guy was <laughs> special. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, so is Michael in yeah. his way. You know, he never makes a top 10 list for guitar players. But you ask any guitar player who's worth anything in the guitar business, they all mention him. Yeah, of course. You know, he's, you don't even have to like the Scorpions. You don't have to like UFO. You don't have to like MSG. But you've got to respect the talent that that man has. Oh, he's incredible. Let me ask you this question that is a non-Michael related question, but is a music related question. You, you, I know that you aren't really not a music fan. Everyone, like you love music, but were you a Stones fan growing up? And did, when you started working with them, did having that gig, other than it being a good job, did it carry any weight? Because you were like, I can't believe I'm working for the Stones. Three little words. <laughs> Fuck the Stones. <laughs> I was a Beatles fan, and I was one of those kids that bought into that whole Beatles versus Stones thing. Really? Of course. Who didn't? Who didn't? I mean, there was always a side to take. Right. You know, and if you ask me, the Beatles are the greatest band that ever was and probably ever will be. Sure. So far ahead of their time. Um, and like it or not, you hear them in almost every band at some point or another. Right. That being said, I am the world's biggest Stones fan now. Sure. Not necessarily because of the music, but I am a fan of the four, the four lads. Right. They are the nicest, most genuine, funny. I mean, Keith is a fucking hoot. You don't get a whole lot of contact with him, but because of where I was on stage, I, I, Ron Wood shook my hand every single day. Keith wouldn't start playing until he gave me his salute. You know? Yeah. If there's anybody in this industry, alive today who has the right to be a fucking asshole it's any one of them after 58 years and counting and they could not be nicer and i fell in love with the man which helped me fall in love with the music yeah i mean truthfully i i play the stones on the jukebox now i could never have done that before do you have a favorite era <laughs> he's gonna yell at me uh no Steel no. wheels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you made her laugh. This is horrible. So my favorite song is off. I think it's called Honk. Is that a is that a record? Something like that. What is that like a two th early two thousands record? Uh, it's not. I think it was after Steel Wheels. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a song called Out of Control. Crazy. That's my favorite Stone song. But, <laughs> but you know, what's so, what's, so weird, what's so weird is that because I was never a fan of music, I generally end up hating what I hear on the radio because when I get introduced to a band, it's live. And right. you know, the live vibe is always so much different. Of course. Uh, I will I will play that particular song when I am in the mood to hear it. And I'm always like, God, this would be so much better if I was standing five feet from Keith and Mick was yelling in my left ear. You know, because you draw on their energy when you see it live, which brings the songs, you know, to life in, in a very different way than you'll get on the record. Of course. Uh, and I, I mean, maybe that's stating the obvious, but again, it's not obvious to me because I didn't, I had the White Album and I had every Kiss record up to Love Gun. I didn't need anything else, you know? So I, I'm truly, I'm truly learning to love the music of my generation as I'm getting too old to appreciate it. <laughs> it's <laughs> funny as a touring person, people, I think it's easy for people to assume, oh, you must discover new music all the time. No, you hear the same one to three bands every night and with little to no exception. Yeah. Which is is just comical to me. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. there are huge yeah. vacuums in in my life where I didn't, I never discovered any of the music that was happening because I was too busy not listening to music. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, not to bring back Michael, but Michael, that's why Michael doesn't play the radio in the car. He does not consume music in any way. You know, so everything that he does is original. I don't consume music because I, usually the shit I'm thinking is is either more interesting or more funny. Um, and I know that that sounds like a kind of a shitty thing to say, but I am I am my greatest entertainer. I I just think up shit. And my wife is like, "Are you losing your mind?" Because I'll be in the corner cracking up over something fucking completely stupid. Right. I'm like, no, I just you know the garage sale that is my mind just produced another little gem that caught me off guard. On tour, do you consume audiobooks at all? No. Podcasts? Nope. No. Nope. I, no. No we'll music. You You're not reading as much anymore, and no podcasts or audiobooks. I will say this: uh, I ended up on TSO because you're so sleep deprived for that nine weeks because it's such a hellish schedule. Uh, you know, you get two days off a week, but you're so tired from doing eight shows in five days that you don't really do much of anything. Um, I did buy a few books to read on my phone just because it was easy for yeah. my hammock. But I like to hold a book. I like to smell a book. I love sure. that's I mean, it, that's what gets me off. I love I love a book. And I've always loved a book. I've loved a book way more than I've ever loved a piece of music. You ever consider writing a book? <laughs> I've written a few things. I've actually sold a couple of stories a long time ago. Uh, I sold like, two stories to a magazine. Oh, wow. Huh? I said, wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. I've, I've sold a painting. I've cooked for money. I've sold an article. You know, I've... I've done some cool shit. I mean, you're a real cousin, Tom, you're a real Renaissance man. Dude, you got no fucking idea. <laughs> you, you're an archeologist. I am. I'm an archeologist. <laughs> I have, I have, I have danced on the TV show fame. I thought you were going to say I've danced for money. Yes, I have danced for money. Um, that's how I got into the screen actors guild. I've acted in movies and television and, and I've owned businesses and, you know, thank God I was never good at any of them or else I'd never have seen Brazil. Right. <laughs> Again, where most of my bad decisions have ever come from. A lot of bad decisions can be made there. Yes. Yes. 3 a.m. Anything's possible in Brazil. Uh, all you have to have is a dream, a terrible dream. <laughs> no, no inhibitions. Well, um, I, I'm going to need 
to take my dogs out shortly. I so I want to I want to wrap it up. I've had a an awesome time talking with you. Uh, I think you're fucking great. I liked you the minute we met. Yeah, we you're... have been friends a good long time. And, and, uh, and I, I will be honest with you, I have always treasured the fact that you're out there somewhere. Because I always knew that there was a decent guy in the music business. Because believe it or not, you don't meet very many. Let's not get excited with the word business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Business implies there's money being exchanged. <laughs> Money's changing hands somewhere. <laughs> Just way, like, you know, way many layers above me. Yes, yes. It's like Mike TV going over your head. Yeah. <laughs> Little particles of Mike TV. That's right. Um, you know, who knows? I might be, I might be out your way. I'm talking about touring this thing, so I might end up in um, Kalamazoo at some point. I'll probably end up flying into Detroit Fun. if I don't drive. Well, if you feel like hanging out, come stay. We're building a we're building a bed for my daughter, and there's an air conditioner in the wall. Wow! So you could have a warm, a warm or cool place to sleep depending on the time of year. But fun fact, just learned this yesterday. Did you know that Gibson Guitars is from Kalamazoo? Well, yeah, that's uh, the intention is that I may be visiting the Heritage Guitar the Heritage Plant, Guitar. which is yeah. I was just uh, I did this I did this whole bit of reading yesterday about Heritage Guitars. I'm like, oh look at that! It kind of looks like a whole bunch of Les Paul Juniors. Really? Yeah, they're yeah. building cool guitars and um, and they and, you know they're all they're all uh, they're all Gibson guys that just refuse to move. Yeah, I'm like, huh? Who knew? Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, apparently everybody knew but me. But, you know, again, I'm new to this business after 21 years. <laughs> I have another friend in Kalamazoo as well. He's He owns a coffee company there. Nice. So. How's your coffee business going? Oh, you know, it's fine. It's just... Uh, One can at a time? Who cares? Yeah, basically. Who cares? Mostly. <laughs> so cool. Well, I sure hope that we get to cross paths. I, it looks like I'm always here. So when are you actually thinking of coming out this way? I don't know. You know, who knows how how this COVID stuff is going to affect. I haven't flown yet since February 2020. And I got to tell you, it's a great drive. Yeah, I've, I've made the drive plenty of times. You know? I, ma I made the drive from Detroit to Seattle in a single shot once. How long did that take? Without drugs. Why I mean, other than coffee. I would only do that for the drugs. I mean, without without the aid of drugs. Right. You, you mean you yeah. were carrying drugs in a car? You just <laughs> <laughs> the, the number one rule, you know. Yeah, bring them with you. We got to have the right drugs to stay awake for that trip. This is true. This is true. Um, so yeah, no, I I will not ever again make a trip in the vicinity of Detroit without reaching out to you. Please do. And again, if I'm not here, if I'm not here, my wife is a lovely hostess. Amazing. Uh, feel free. I mean, the places we call it the black hat lodge. It's where all the bad guys stay. <laughs> so, you know, you're always welcome. Please come see us. I will. All right. Brother. And if when you're in uh, the Hudson Valley or in New York, the, the same rule applies. Yes, if Bastard Pussycat plays Poughkeepsie, I'll pop on up the road. The chance is just down the, just a spell down the road, buddy. <laughs> yes, it is. But I'm closer to Albany, actually. No, I know, I know. Yeah, you're I'm right. like 35 minutes from. Uh, although, you know, Faster Pussycat, they're not playing the egg. No, they're not. But the chance, if they're you know perennials. <laughs> sure, you betcha. <laughs> All right, I'm going to kill the recording, and I can't wait to hear this uh, this story. Yeah, man. <laughs>